Hey, Care Partners, Teresa Youngstrom here. How's your week going? You know, I don't know if you're caring for somebody or if you're someone who that's your job that you do on a regular basis. Maybe you're loving someone at home through this crazy disease, but I'm glad you're here. You know what? There's a lot of great information we're going to share today. I've got a PowerPoint for you too, so you can go back and gather even more information or share it with someone else. So thanks again for being here. Today, we're going to talk about symptoms of dementia, and it's broad and wide. And so what I did was I took a survey with a bunch of my colleagues, um, we'll call them the birds, and they are amazing, and asked them to give me, you know, they're all involved in dementia care and some uh, some way, shape, or form. And so I asked them, what was the first symptom you saw? So that's what we're going to go over tonight. We're going to go over symptoms, and then we're going to talk about, well, then what do you do when you have symptoms? So let's get started. So yeah, first symptoms with dementia. So something someone brought up was not following the conversation. So that symptom, that would mean that... Um, you know, your loved one, you're having a conversation and for some reason they're not tracking with you. They're not uh, connecting the dots and it's almost a wait what and they haven't followed anything. Now, sometimes our brains just go off on a tangent or we're re actually reading something when someone's talking to us, right? That has happened. But this would be something you're seeing on a regular basis. And, you know, just before we really dive in deep into all these symptoms, if you're worried that you're seeing symptoms, you know what? Do a little journaling. And um, you might find out that, well, it was a bad week and whatever that was that they were doing that had you all worried, it it stopped. Okay? Or, you know, maybe you end up taking them to the doctor and have it checked out. But I would journal these things. And either way, either it goes away, great. But if it doesn't, you know what? It's great to have documentation because if you're like me, it's hard to remember everything. But it's great to have the documentation to take to your doctor and let them see what you've been seeing over the past week or months, okay? Weeks or month. So not following the conversation. So you're trying to have a conversation. It's going on days um, days at a time. You're seeing more and more of this where it just doesn't seem like mom or is tracking with you anymore. She can't seem to follow. You just told her this great story, what the grandkids did, and then she's um, she's still at square one, okay? So not following the conversation. Maybe um, looking lost or confused. This was a first symptom that somebody brought up, and so maybe your person looks like they're staring off more. Um, they're not they're not paying as much attention. Um, maybe they used to love this certain show, but they're not really tracking with that either. It might just be looking off in the distance and uh, like they're trying to figure things out. Okay. So maybe they're just looking a little bit more distant or a little more confused. Next on the list, we have um, change in personality. So it's true that sometimes we have someone who's been quite the introvert, and now they want to meet and greet everybody they see. They might be to wave to people out of the car window. I had that happen recently. Um, or maybe it goes the other direction. Maybe now they were very outgoing, but now they've become more afraid, and they're very timid, and they don't want to leave the house anymore. They don't want to go to bingo, and they always loved bingo. They don't want to go out to lunch. They don't want to go to church. Okay, so this personality thing can go one of two ways. They can become more um, social, or maybe they've become, to the point of annoyance sometimes is what we see. They're wanting to hug everybody <laughs> and shake everybody's hand. Okay, that would definitely be a, uh, something I would look into a little bit more. So one, one woman said that she had a family member who asked her to assess him and because she's in the medical field, and um, he complained that he's reading without retention. So can you imagine that? You're trying to read the story, and you go through a, a page, and then you're like, oh, I don't even remember what I just read. And you know, that can happen to any of us. I mean, think about how many times you're driving down the street, and you're, you're kind of lost in a thought, and then you realize you don't remember the last three, five miles. Um, I don't want to I know some of you say you can't remember the last 10 or 20 minutes, but <laughs> let's just leave it with a few minutes. But that can happen in, a, in with normal, just normal distraction with our brains. But this particular gentleman said, you know, he'd read that page and read that page, and he just really wasn't retaining the story anymore. And it made it very disappointing for him. And 
he kind of lost his interest in reading and he used to love to read. Now, some individuals, if you're thinking about this, we can switch them to an auditory um, type of a, um, a time, you know, something to pass time that they enjoy, a way to tell stories. There are lots of audio books that you can get. And, um, you know, or even Spotify's. And so this way they could listen to it, but they don't have to be reading the material. And they still might find it more enjoyable, even though they can't read the words. Okay. It's always good to think outside the box. I'm always trying to remind you of that. So another symptom was word finding um, or using the wrong words. Uh, you might have them calling, you know, the cat, the horse, or you might have them call the car, the motorcycle, or, you know, the train, the bus. And um, I think a little bit of that as we age can be um, in the file of normal aging. But I think it's when we're seeing a pattern of this, when you're documenting this and it's happening, you know, it's happening more and more frequently, then I would think that would be something to go on your list as a worrisome sign. You think this this is worrying you, that they're having a lot of word finding or just misuse of particular words. Um, but you know, and some individuals, they'll say the word emphatically and they're, they're insisting that they're correct. And you're trying to connect the dot. What, what they're saying cotton ball, but you know, they're not talking about cotton balls. And so you're trying to search real quick. And sometimes you're like, wow, I had no idea. You know, I'm, I'm really excited. You told me about that because it's not worth fighting if you don't understand. And for heaven's sakes, don't drill them with questions, um, asking more information, because if they're already having trouble with word finding or using the wrong word, the last thing you want to do is, you know, give them a lesson on using the correct word and pull out your dictionary and those things. You guys know that, though. I shouldn't have to say that. So there are folks who have a fear of forgetting an appointment. And, and then they're going to arrive way early for their appointments, you know, and she also said that they had a heightened dependence on the calendar. So forever looking at the calendar, forever adjusting the calendar, forever calling appointments and changing appointments. Um, I knew a woman, she did live on her own. She was in assisted living, a uh, very safe environment. She wasn't a wanderer or an exit seeker, um, but she had the calendar out every day. And she was whiting out and changing appointments every day. Um, and, and so then, then the family really didn't know when her appointments were supposed to be scheduled. So at that point, we need someone to come alongside and help monitor those things and, um, and be sure and let the doctor's office know that we've got, you know, some dementia here, or we've got something forgetful and we're going to need, um, things to be verified through maybe the POA or another family member. Okay. So try and think outside the box and think about how you're going to manage some of these things if they turn out to be real. But honestly, we're not sure it's a dementia yet, is it? We're just talking about symptoms, just symptoms. And maybe we're journaling these. So trouble figuring out the tip at the restaurant, you know, coming up with 20%. What is 20%? And so, you know, most of us do 10% and double that. And we know 20% um, makes it really simple. But if this is someone who maybe was really good with numbers and now they're having trouble figuring out the tip, that could be a, that could be a sign. Um, uh, quitting activities, like one lady said, you know, her loved, her uh it was a parent quit the choir because they couldn't read the music anymore. So quitting activities because either you feel insecure about being there or you feel like you can't participate in the way um, that makes it enjoyable. I did know a woman who loved to play pickleball. And so there was a caregiver who did take her to play pickleball. She was far beyond diagnosis, okay? She was living with uh, dementia and she was on her journey. And uh, she had good people around her, good caregivers, and they tried to keep her as physically engaged as she always had been. It was a good situation. But it's interesting, she'd get to the pickleball and <laughs> she always had to be right. And so it was never her fault that the ball went out or she messed up the, you know, whatever, and uh, got more and more challenging. They, the family did go ahead and notify everyone else who played in her group 
that yes, she has a problem. Yes, she has a caregiver. If we could just beg for some grace, this is great activity for her. And uh, on the days that she's here, if you could work with us. And you know what? Frequently, you notify people that there's somebody struggling, they have a need, and if there's any way they could they could help you with this. Um, but it's so great to communicate that instead of just letting them be annoyed, thinking she's just being demanding and bossy. Because she was demanding and bossy, but it was because of her own brain failure. Does that make sense? Okay, you'd hate to have them quit going. I know um, going to church can be really enjoyable uh, because folks typically like music, and if the music has been important to them, then you'd be surprised the way they'll know these hymns and know these songs and that that brings them great joy. So I would say look at this person's life once we're once we're beyond the diagnosis and we're figuring out how to love them along on this journey and think about routine, routine, routine and figuring out what activities bring them joy and what activities only cause them stress and anxiety. I wouldn't force them to keep going to the gym because you want to be there or you feel they need to be there. I remember a gentleman, oh my gosh, this is Pat from the way past. Um, he got um, he got an exercise bike at his house and was forcing his little wife to keep getting on there. And there was a treadmill too. And he would stand behind her to make sure she didn't get off of that treadmill. And that poor little lady, she was so tired and really had to have a talk about you know, when is it still appropriate? When, um, when is it possible she's going to get hurt? I just think he desperately did not want her to decline. He didn't want her to decline physically. He didn't want her to decline emotionally, um, or, or her brain to decline. And he found himself almost cracking the whip to get her to keep exercising. So I think we have to have a balance Okay. If it's routine and they enjoy doing it and they're safe doing this, great. If it's to a point where they're hating doing this, they might get hurt. Um, we have to be careful. Do they have an injury? You know, are they complaining a lot when they're on the treadmill? That would be a different thing. Okay. So let's use a lot of common sense. And um, maybe it's good to even bounce those ideas off of someone else who's on the journey with you. Um, that might, might be able to help you make those decisions. So um, complaining that the car or the appliances are broken because they could not operate them. This is a very common complaint that we have or symptom that we see early on is for some reason they don't remember um, how to turn the car on or they don't remember where the turn signal is or they don't remember how to put the car in gear. Okay. So it's obviously broken. This thing needs to be repaired. It's broken only because in their mind, they can't remember how to make it work. And so if they're one of those individuals that don't have awareness about their disease, then it, it's going to be somebody else's fault. And so the car might be broken. Um, along the lines of this, changing the remote out, getting a new TV, changing the microwave. I'm telling you, the coffee pot. Listen, if they're able to do those things and their muscle memory can reach back and still remember how to make a pot of coffee, I am not going to change out those appliances. Please, please, please. I had a daughter once move in with her mom thinking that was a great idea. And it was, she was sacrificing hugely. She set up a room in the basement so that mom could stay in her own home. Isn't that great? But then called me a week or two later and said, this is terrible. It's, and she's furious. It's, she has anxiety and it's miserable. And I said, tell me more. And she said, I mean, you'd think she would appreciate. I, I, I redecorated her bedroom. I moved her bed to a more appropriate place in that bedroom, got rid of that little TV and got her a real sweet, you know, um, flat screen TV for her room. And, um, and these lamps, they were horrendous, you know, and I got her some new lamps and I said, uh Oh, you know what? We need to put it all back. And she said, what are you talking about? I said, you have changed her world. She cannot, she can't learn new things. And we kind of sometimes say that lightly as we can't learn new tricks. And it's true. When you change those things out, it's very frustrating because 
in their muscle memory, they remember how to use that old lamp. They remember how to use that old remote. Probably the buttons are worn from the one station they always watch and the on and off button. But now you change all that stuff up. Now it doesn't even feel like they're home. And they may want to go home. It's not restful for them. It's not comforting. It's not their safe place that it should be. And so they're going to have trouble resting in there, especially if you move the furniture around. That's just a huge no-no in my book. Okay. So don't go out and buy new appliances. It's okay. We'll use those old ones and we'll let them, <laughs> let them wear out on their own. And frequently we're trying to find a coffee, make coffee pot, just like the one she had, because then she'll know how to use it. Does that make sense? So one symptom you might find is things are broken, but it's really because they don't know how to work them anymore. Okay. Bring my slides back up. Um, so balance and gait changes, that's definitely can be a symptom. So now you're noticing, you know, just even walking to the car um, or walking back to the bathroom, their gait seems off. They're walking like they haven't really walked like that before. And it's not so much a limp, but their gait is not. It's almost like they don't really know where to, how to put their feet down. It's not heel toe anymore. They might be shuffling, might be a change like that. Um, and just when they get up, you're notice, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, they're having more balance issues. And so definitely something to make note of and um, definitely something we're going to have to work on. They may need some PT and OT. Maybe they need to. Um, and then we immediately think, oh, we're going to get them a cane or a walker. Well, I'd say if you live with them or someone lives with them that can say, oh my goodness, mom, I forgot. I forgot the doctor wants you to use this walker thing. But I can tell you that if the short term is damaged, and most of the time it is, it's not a good time to give them a new device because a new device, that, what did I say before? They can't learn new tricks. So they're not going to remember that they use that device frequently and they're going to park it. So don't spend money on it. You might bring the furniture uh, a little closer together so they can use that to rest their hands on. And it's okay to use those things if you are there. I wouldn't act like you forgot your walk. Oh yeah, I wouldn't do that. Forgot your walker again. Don't place blame. And no one likes to be reminded by their kids for sure um, that they're not doing something right. So if you do have to remind, I would say, oh my goodness, mom, the doctor wants you to use this. Make it someone else who's giving the orders and not you, not you, the caregiver, the care partner, the spouse or the daughter's son. Okay. Um, remember it's about the relationship. So losing items and then accusing other people of stealing from them. So we do see this. And so, you know, my purse, uh, somebody stole my purse again. This is a very common one. Someone stole my keys. Someone stole, and, um, they may even blame you for this. Uh, we frequently go on a search saying, oh my gosh, you you know, you should validate that. You've your purse is gone. Well, we we can't put up with that. Let's let's go on a search and see what we can come up with, you know, and let's ask around. If they happen to be at a community, you know, it's okay to say, let's go check with the nurses. Maybe they know. Let's check with, you know, your caregiver. Maybe they know. And so go ahead, but validate their position. But at the same time, your eyeballs are scanning for where that purse is because she frequently leaves it in the hamper. Okay. So you once you learn their routine, you can come up with it. I know several daughters that have several gray purses. So they can run out to their car and get another one that has a tissue and has the tissue pack in it and whatever she, else she usually carries. So we accommodate these things, these forgetful things. But early on, before a diagnosis, losing things. You might have to journal that, that they're losing things all the time. It's becoming a trend, okay? And then they're accusing other people of stealing from them. Okay, trouble with finances or the inability to understand bank statements. This is a very challenging one. If your loved one was the person who always was in charge of paying the bills too, this can be very challenging. So, um, so keep, make note of that. Uh, you might see when you visit that the bills are just piling up there, that they have designated a place to put the bills when they come in the mail and, you know, they're still getting the paper bill, um, or it might be a notice that the bill has not been paid. Okay. An alert type, type form. So 
pay attention to things like that because that can definitely be a symptom if um, not only they're they're not remembering to pay things, but then they can't read the statement when it comes to let them know that the bill didn't get paid last month. All right. So that's very challenging and getting them to let go of the purse strings and let someone else manage the finances, that can be really tough. There have been times when we would say, you know what, dad, um, I'm not very good at this. And I was hoping you could teach me some things about finances. And maybe that'll give you a little door open into visualizing some of the documents and how he files things and uh, begin to educate yourself. There have been times where um, the person wasn't comfortable with a family member, but you can hire people to come in and manage the finances for them. And sometimes they'll be gentler and more cordial with a stranger than they're going to be um, with someone who's very familiar that the relationship might not be just perfect. Okay. But definitely can be a symptom when you come in to visit, you haven't been there in a month and there's a stack of mail there's a stack of mail. It hasn't been opened. There's a stack of mail. I remember caring for a woman. She lived in a high-rise retirement community in town. She was on the 11th floor, and um, there was lots of money. But I can tell you she was losing money left and right because the stack of bills was a, at least a foot tall. And the late fees and the craziness, we were able to get someone to come in and help. But um, so just just have your eyes wide open, okay? Um, hygiene issues, okay. Um, mom, do you need a shower? Which I wouldn't ask a yes, no question. But early on, you might say, oh, you know, did you get a shower? And they say, I already did that. And you're thinking, doesn't smell like you did. So hygiene issues, you know, there's something... Um, very challenging about them about getting a shower and just remembering even changing their clothes. I was talking to a woman just today on the phone and her husband showers every four days and changes his clothes. He doesn't have an odor issue, thankfully, um, but that's their routine and that's right now how they do it. Um, you know what? Not every care partner out there is set is is um made to give do hygiene with another person it may not be be in your wheelhouse you might be a better manager i could shower them you manage um setting up the the schedule for the caregivers right we we do different things and we're gifted in different ways so we can do different things but if you're having trouble getting someone to shower or to do their hygiene it is okay to hire someone to come in and do that. And like I said, they'll probably do it for a stranger better than they would do it for you, the familiar person. And we don't want you to fight with them. We don't want you to do anything to damage your relationship with this person. So if it's becoming a fight, the hygiene part, well, then let's see what we can do to get someone else. The other thing is I'm all about either or questions and not yes, no questions. I don't want you to say, are you going to shower today? into the disease, they frequently just say no. They kind of remember that saying yes means you do stuff to me and no means you might leave me the heck alone. And so they learn to say no. So instead of yes, no questions, why don't you say, give them an either or, are you going to shower or just wash up and let them choose? Are you going to eat ham or turkey today? Do you want to go to the bank or to, I don't know, um, to the office first and let them have some control of some choices with just either ors, okay? Sometimes that'll help us get hygiene taken care of with an either or and let them feel like they're in control. Um, but yeah, routine, routine, routine. The other thing is if your, per your loved one has always showered at night, well, let's do that at night. If your person has always done it, um, in the morning, then I would try and, um, adapt things so that we position them to win. Okay. So keep things as close to their routine, not the caregiver's routine as close to their routine. Does that make sense? I mean, it's one thing to have the caregiver's routine, but, I'm just saying, 
location and activities and parts of the puzzle that we can manage to keep them on track and happy um, and position them to win, that's going to really go a long way for you in caring for someone. So hygiene issues can definitely be a symptom with dementia. Okay. Um, one lady said there was a fire in the microwave and that was their symptom. <laughs> um, they had obviously put something in the microwave. I don't know if it was, they didn't take the metal lid off the jar or whatever it was. Um, sometimes a bag of popcorn gets put in there for about 10 minutes instead of one minute. That's a problem too. We definitely, I remember having a fire at the hospital. Um, someone had put popcorn in for too long. The hospital wasn't very happy about that. Um, and all the firemen had to come to, oh my word, that was a long time ago. Um, so anyway, fire in the microwave could be your symptom that your loved one is not doing great. The inability um, to initiate things. So they can't get started. They can't get started cleaning the house. They can't get started paying the bills. They can't get started with managing appointments, social greetings, um, like Christmas cards. And one lady she bought, she went out and bought like, went to the dollar store. I think she had 15 boxes of Christmas cards and never got to them. She couldn't, she could buy the cards, but she couldn't initiate doing the cards. Okay. Um, getting lost when driving. That's another symptom that someone put forward, getting lost. And this per she said she had gone to the same hair salon, you know, for decades and that now she could no longer um, find that. You know, I was talking to a gentleman the other day and he had his TV turned up to like level 38, which was kind of uh, interesting since he had hearing aids. And I said, can you adjust your hearing aid? And he said, I don't remember. And yet I knew he had done it in the past. So for me, with that gentleman, that might be something we would write down, okay? Um, so if you're seeing symptoms and now you've journaled them and we're seeing them, it's been a month and we're seeing more and more things, what do we do? Well, I suggest you see the family doctor, okay? Let's do that first. Because did you know there's a whole list of diagnoses that can give us symptoms that are like dementia? but they're not a true dementia. A true dementia means, you know, parts of the brain are dying. It is progressive and it doesn't happen. It doesn't come on overnight. Like sometimes I'll have a family member call and say, oh my gosh, Bob is so confused. And it's like, it came on overnight. And I'm thinking, well, dementia doesn't usually do that. But there, here are some things and I put them on the list here for you. So you can go back and look at these. Here are some things they could be hearing issues. Definitely. I had um, a, a woman call and say, you know, he's just not the same. Something's wrong and he's not the same. And I, well, so let's rule out these things. We go to the doctor and we look for these things, but his hearing had gone. You know, if someone tells you you're not hearing that well, would you believe them and go get it checked out? <laughs> we frequently understand that our own hearing is going. A urinary tract infection can make us look really, really like we have dementia. Okay. Having worked in the ER for a lot of years in my nursing career, we would get a squad coming in, mental status change, rule out CVA, right? Cerebrovascular accident or stroke. Um, and do you know probably 50% of those, if that was a person that was over the age of 50, was a urinary tract infection. It was the first test we did. So just know that urinary tract infection, but that comes on in, in a matter of, it can be just one day, but usually it's a matter of days and it gets so worse. But these people can be completely out of their tree, completely not know what's going on. Okay. And very, very, very confused and aggressive. And it can be a urinary tract infection. So low B12 vitamin can make us look like we have a dementia. So can a thyroid problem. I had another gentleman, the wife called, he's not right. This, my husband is not right. And turned out his thyroid had died. But within three months, do you know they had him back a hundred percent? How cool is that? And it was a thyroid issue. So don't assume the worst when we're seeing symptoms. We've journaled, we've got a pattern. We need to get to the doctor and rule out some things. Okay. Um, it could be other brain problems, could be stroke, tumor, you know, or maybe they've had a head injury and you didn't see it. You didn't witness the fall and they hit their head really hard so they could have a concussion, you know, or maybe they've got a bleed in there. I mean, things happen. Depression, Lyme disease. These are other things that can make us look like we have a dementia. Hypoglycemia, sugar being low, 
vertigo. Oh my goodness. You want to talk about gait change, vertigo, feeling dizzy from an inner ear challenge. All right. And other medication issues. Boy, if only people would always take their medicine as prescribed, wouldn't that be great? But it just doesn't happen. We make mistakes. It's part of it. Um, part of getting older and part of how we care for each other. So these are things um, that can make you look like you have a dementia, but those are treatable. Those things are at least, it's not a true dementia. I would say brain bleed treatable. Well, you know, you need to see, you need to see the, the vascular surgeon about that or what we're going to do. I'm not the doctor, but anyway, those are things that are not a true dementia. So today we talked about symptoms of dementia. Okay. Hopefully that was enlightening to you and hopefully you've got a greater, um, grasp on what those, um, what those symptoms look like. Okay. We went over quite a few. It could be other things. All right. I'm sure you have more. So thanks for being here today. I want to give a shout out to Griffo Productions, my broadcaster. They're awesome. Um, if you ever want to start a podcast, look up Griffo Productions because they've been really, really fabulous to work, work with. Um, again, please like, share, subscribe to Memory Care with Teresa Youngstrom so we can reach even more people with great ideas and um, provide um, a place where you can come and learn uh, common sense, you know, um, suggestions and ideas for how to love someone on this journey with dementia. Okay? All right, everybody. Thanks for being here. And just keep in mind, you got this. <laughs>